Well, can I say that it has truly been a real delight and privilege to be with you at the conference over this uh, weekend. I do thank the committee uh, for the invitation extended to me and uh, to all of you for the warmth of uh, your welcome. Uh, it's been a real blessing to be here and to be sharing with you uh, in this way. Uh, I want to thank you also for extending the invitation to uh, Ruth. There's no possibility of me ever taking her away to a hotel. So uh, for, for you to do that was such a blessing. And I thank you really uh, for your kindness in that regard. She has had to return um, to Belfast this morning because she has a Sabbath school class and she needed to go back uh, for that. Uh, so I stand before you ruthless. Uh, and, uh, our associate minister in Stramalis, the Reverend John Roger, trained in the Reformed Theological College, and uh, he often speaks of his training there very warmly. And during that time, he had opportunity to preach in a number of your congregations. And I know John has a great affection for the Reformed Presbyterian <coughs> Church. And uh, when I said to him about this invitation, John, I'm going to be away for a weekend. Uh, he was more than delighted about that, and uh, uh, he would want to be warmly remembered uh, to those of you who know him here uh, today. Now let us turn again in the scriptures to the book of the Revelation and to chapter 21. Uh, Edward has read in chapter 7 in that beautiful vision of the glory that is to come, that beautiful vision of heaven. And I read now a further vision that was given to the Apostle John here in Revelation and chapter 21. And we read uh, from the beginning. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them and they will be his people. And God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain any more, for the former things have passed away. And he who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. Also he said, Write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. And he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give from the spring of the water of life without payment. The one who conquers will have this heritage, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. But as for the cowardly, the faithless, the detestable, as for murderers, the sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars... Their portion will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. Then came out of the seven angels who had the seven bowls full of the seven last plagues and spoke to me, saying, Come, I will show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great high mountain and showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, having the glory of God, its radiance like a most rare jewel, like a jasper, clear as crystal. It had a great high wall with twelve gates, and at the gates twelve angels, and on the gates the names of the twelve tribes of the sons of Israel were inscribed. On the east, three gates. On the north, three gates. On the south, three gates. And on the west, three gates. And the wall of the city had twelve foundations. And on them were the twelve names of the twelve apostles of the Lamb. And the one who spoke with me had a measuring rod of gold to measure the city and its gates and walls. The city lies four square. 
its length the same as its width. And he measured the city with his rod, 12,000 stadia. Its length and width and height are equal. He also measured its wall, 144 cubits by human measurement, which is also an angel's measurement. The wall was built of jasper, while the city was pure gold, clear as glass. The foundations of the wall of the city were adorned with every kind of jewel. The first was jasper, the second sapphire, the third agate, the fourth emerald, the fifth onyx, the sixth carnelian, the seventh chrysolite, the eighth beryl, the ninth topaz, the tenth chrysophrase, the eleventh jacinth, the twelfth amethyst. And the twelve gates were twelve pearls, each of the gates made of a single pearl, and the street of the city was pure gold, transparent as glass. And I saw no temple in the city, for its temple is the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb. And the city has no need of a sun or moon to shine in it, for the glory of God gives its light, and its lamp is the Lamb. By its light will the nations walk, and the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it. And its gates will never be shut by day, and there will be no night there. They will bring into it the glory and the honour of the nations. But nothing unclean will ever enter it, nor anyone who does what is detestable or false, but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. <coughs> well, may the Lord bless this his word unto us. Amen. One of the things that struck me in conversation over this weekend is simply the similarities between our two churches and our two denominations. We are praying much for men for the ministry, for example. Uh, we feel the need at the present time. Uh, many of us are getting older and uh, we are longing to see the Lord raise up young men with gifts for ministry among us. We're praying for an outpouring of the Holy Spirit, as you are, upon the work and witness of the church, that we would see growth, that the work would go forward. But one of the big encouragements that there has been within our, our churches over, over many years now is, is the work of young people's camps. And I think you can identify with that, that this is a good work, an encouraging work. When children and young people go away for a week in the summer and spend time together in, in recreation and fun and good Bible teaching. It's been a wonderful way of bringing together children and young people from the different congregations. Getting to know each other. Finding friendship and fellowship together. With three camps. A junior camp, an intermediate camp and a senior camp. And uh, I want you to think just for a moment about that intermediate camp and its title. Everybody knows what that means. It's intermediate. It's between the juniors and the seniors. Once you graduate from the juniors to the intermediate, well, you feel you're really getting quite grown up. But it's, it's not the final stage. There is something further. There is something yet to come. Another camp. Many of you will be familiar, depending on which part of the province in which you live, with the whole idea of an intermediate school. That's a school that you go to, but it's, it's not the final tier of your education. It, it'll be followed by some kind of senior school. It's intermediate. And so when we come to the scriptures... We often speak about the intermediate state. And when we use that expression, we know entirely what we're speaking about. We're speaking about what happens to a Christian when they die. We will instinctively, in our church circles, won't we? We'll go to the shorter catechism and to that great answer in question 37. What benefits do believers receive from Christ at death? The souls of believers are at their death made perfect in holiness and do immediately pass into glory. 
and their bodies being still united to Christ do rest in their graves till the resurrection. What a great answer. That's the intermediate state. And of course the scriptures are clear that uh, what I've just read out from the catechism is the very truth of God. This is what happens when a believer dies, his or her soul does immediately pass into the presence of Jesus in glory. They have gone to be with Christ. Listen to Paul, please. 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 8. Yes, we are of good courage. And we would rather be away from the body and at home with the Lord. When we die, if we are believers in Jesus Christ, we are immediately at home with the Lord. But again, Paul, Philippians chapter 1 and verse 23, these words that you'll know well and that are so comforting. I am hard pressed between the two. My desire is to depart and to be with Christ. To be with Christ. When we die as a believer in Jesus, we go to be with Christ. Our soul does immediately pass into the presence of Jesus in heaven. And of course the classic passage is from the, the crucifixion, the death of Jesus on the cross. There he is dying on that central cross and two men, criminals, are being crucified either side of him. And one of them comes under conviction of sin. One of them, God by his Holy Spirit, is at work in his life. And he prays, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And what does Jesus say? Today you will be with me. In paradise. Today. Right now. At the moment of your death. You will pass. Into the glory. Of heaven. So we often think about. This intermediate state. There are aspects of it. That are hard for us to grasp. And to understand. If we're, if we're absolutely honest. The idea of a disembodied spirit. Experiencing the blessedness of heaven. And worshipping Christ there. Is, is kind of difficult for us. Just to fully get our heads. Around that. But we receive and accept. What we find in scripture. Which is a wonderfully comforting truth. That our future. As believers in Jesus Christ. Is wonderful. The glory of heaven. Awaits us. At the moment of death. But that is not the final state. Something is yet to be. Something further is yet to happen. And it's this we're thinking about this morning. Glorification. We've considered justification and adoption and sanctification but just now we want to think about glorification what is glorification it is the final state of our salvation when in perfect bodies free from sin we enter into the new heavens and the new earth to spend eternity worshipping Jesus in all his glory now, I think that that's a good definition of glorification. You asked me where I got it from. I have to say to you, I stole it from about four different people. And I did sort of mashed their definition together. So I hope it's, I hope it's been mashed in the proper way. But uh, let me read it to you again. Because I think it is a fair summary of, of this wonderful truth of glorification. It is the final stage of our salvation. When in perfect bodies, free from sin, we enter into the new heavens and the new earth to spend eternity worshipping Jesus in all his glory. The final stage. The short of catechism does speak about this in the very next question, in question 38, what benefits do believers receive from Christ at the resurrection? At the resurrection, believers being raised up in glory shall be openly acknowledged and acquitted in the day of judgment and made perfectly blessed in the full enjoying of God to all eternity. And there is the golden sheet. Romans 8 and verse 
30. And this is a wonderful text in relation to glorification. Those whom he predestined, he called. Those whom he called, he justified. And those whom he justified, he glorified. And what's so significant about that text? It is this. That Paul is so certain of his glorification that he speaks about it in the, in the past tense as if it has already occurred. So certain is he of the glory that is to come. You were chosen in Christ before the foundation of the world. You were called by the Lord who was at work within you by his Holy Spirit. Who enabled you to reach out in faith unto Jesus Christ. You're justified in the sight of God. Your glorification is certain and sure. Now it seems to me that over these days when we've been looking together at the scriptures, uh, the number of points has been reducing. We started with five, we moved to four yesterday, and this morning we've only three. When, what, and where? When will we be glorified? What will our new glorified bodies be like? And where will we spend eternity in our new perfected glorified bodies? When will we be glorified? And the answer to that question is when Jesus returns. When he comes again in power and glory. Uh, let's think about that just for a moment in a general sense and then in a more specific sense. Let's never lose sight of the fact that although life seems to just be going on in the normal way, you get up in the morning, you have your shower, you have your breakfast, you get dressed, you go to your work. The weekend slightly different but you have a routine on a Saturday and on a Lord's Day and week gives way to week and you fulfill your routine and you go through the ordinary things of life day after day after day. But one day this will all change. The heavens will open and Jesus will return. 1 Thessalonians 5 and verses 2 and 3. The Apostle Paul has a lot to say about the return of Christ. I don't know if you like statistics. There are some people who are just real status. You know, and you talk to them about sport. And uh, uh, they're able just like that to name the Leeds United team of 1972. You know, just just oozes out of them. They, they love stats. Others just think, oh no, that's so dull. But for those of you who like stats, the Apostle Paul, on average, mentions the return of Christ once every 13 verses. That's quite high, isn't it? Once every 13 verses. That's, that shows the importance of this truth. Listen to what he says. First Thessalonians 5, verse 2. You yourselves are fully aware... That the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. While people are saying there is peace and security. Then sudden destruction will come upon them. As labor pains upon a pregnant woman. And they will not escape. The day of the Lord will come. As the disciples are gazing up into heaven. When Jesus ascends into glory after his Resurrection, the angel speaks to the disciples. And what does he say in Acts 1 and at verse 11? Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. And Jesus himself speaks again and again and again about his return. In those beautiful words in John chapter 14, words that are of such comfort to us. What does he say in John 14, 3? If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again. And all of Matthew 24 and all of Matthew 25, the Olivet Discourse is given over to the teaching of Jesus himself concerning his return. And he tells us there, he's coming suddenly, he's coming unexpectedly, he's coming like a thief in the night, but he will come. Sometimes in our reformed uh, circles, we, we put the brakes on that. We say, now wait a minute, haven't you heard about the signs? Don't you know there's going to be earthquakes and wars 
and famine? Well, yes, I do. That's what Jesus says in Matthew 24. But do you watch the news? Ah, you say, but, but wait a minute. What about the Antichrist? Well, we don't have time to get into that this morning. What about the conversion of Israel, if that's your conviction regarding Romans 9 to 11, that there will be a movement among Israel, among the Jewish people before Jesus comes? What about the gospel being taken to all the nations of the world? Wow. Well, what about the communications revolution through which we're living? Mm, the speed with which information has been sent out, gospel information all over the world. Yes, there are things that are to occur before Christ returns. We know that. But let's not lose sight of the fact that suddenly and unexpectedly the clouds will open and Christ will come in power and glory. And his appearing will take men and women by surprise. When will we be glorified? When Christ returns and he will come. This should stir us, brothers and sisters, evangelistically. This should stir us. Because this day, which is a day of judgment, is approaching. This day when all the nations of the world will be gathered before Jesus. This day will come and it should stir us. Because those people who live across your hedge. Those folk who you work with, wherever you work. If they know not Christ, they will stand before him on the day of his appearing. And on that day, many different things will happen. But one of the things that will happen, which is of particular reference in relation to this matter of glorification, is that Jesus will raise the dead. He will raise the dead. Listen to what he himself says in John chapter 5 and in verses 28 and, and 29. John 5, 28 and 29. Do not marvel at this. The hour is coming when all who are in the tombs will hear his voice and come out. Those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of judgments. So, so bodies are going to be raised from the grave. There will be resurrection. The resurrection of all on the day when Jesus comes. Bodies and souls will be reunited. And listen to what will happen to those who are believers. 1 Corinthians 15 verse 51. I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep but we shall all be changed. In a moment... In the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet, the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable and we shall be changed. And Paul again in Philippians 3 in verses 20 and 21 tells us uh, of this resurrection, of the reuniting of body and soul and of how the believer on that day when Jesus comes... What will happen to the saint? The Lord Jesus Christ will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body by the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself. He will transform our body so that it will be like his glorious body on the day when he comes. Body and soul reunited. And if we're alive, if we're on the face of the earth when Jesus comes, what will that be like for us? Are we in some way going to miss out? No, this is the very issue which, which Paul is addressing in 1 Thessalonians 4 and 5. And, and he tells us in 1 Thessalonians 4 at verse 16 that if we're on the face of the earth, if we're alive when Jesus comes, the Lord will descend from heaven with a cry of command with the voice of an archangel and with the trumpet of God, the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. We'll not miss out. The dead in Christ will be raised first, bodies and souls reunited. But we who are alive will be caught up with them and transformed on that day to his people on the day of his return. He is to give a new, perfected, glorified body. It'll occur 
when he comes. Now the second question is what? What will this body be like? And actually the New Testament doesn't say a great deal about this. It really says nothing is silent on what kind of body will be given to the unregenerate. Someone has said, whatever body the unregenerate are given on the day of resurrection, when bodies and souls are reunited, will be a body suitable for the place to which they are going. But what about us who are believers, who have faith in Jesus? What will this new, glorified, perfected body be like? I say, don't get into that. It doesn't really matter. I've found, to be honest, as you get older, it does matter. Does it not? But we know one another in heaven. But we recognize one another in glory. As you get older, and more and more of those, those people in, in this life who are precious to you in Christ are taken from you. You begin to think about seeing them again, don't you? And will we know one another in heaven? See, I believe we will, as I trust we'll see in a moment. That whenever this body will be like, this new, perfected, glorified body that will be given on the day of Christ's coming, there will be recognition in heaven. Folks say, well, just look at the resurrection body of Jesus. When Jesus came back after his resurrection and engaged with his disciples and with the people on the road to Emmaus and with others, they recognized him. His body was somewhat different, but they recognized him. I, I'm not sure, to be honest. I'm not sure that we can draw a straight line from the resurrection body of Jesus to the glorified body that will be given on the day when he comes. And climb towards the view that when Christ ascended into heaven, that there was a further transformation took place concerning his body. And it is interesting in Philippians 3, for example, when Paul talks about the body that we will be given, he speaks of it as being like Christ's glorious body or glorified body. We shall be like him, we're told, in Glory. That great text in 1 John chapter 3 and following uh, from the beginning there uh, speaks about that. Beloved, we are God's children now. What we will be has not yet appeared, but we know that when he appears, we shall be like him. Think of him on the Mount of Transfiguration in, for example, Matthew 17, where he's shining in all his divine glory and, and divine brightness. When he comes, when bodies and souls are reunited, when we are glorified and perfected, we shall be like unto his glorified body. And what is that like? Well, in 1 Corinthians 15, which is a key chapter in terms of the resurrection and the resurrection body, Paul tells us in verses 42 to 44 something of what this body will be like. He is making an analogy here between that which is sown and that which grows up. Suppose, men, you wanted to sort of, I don't want to get all sort of woosy and romantic or whatever, but suppose you wanted to show affection to your wife, right? You're going along in the car and you think it's a while since I've, you know, done anything nice. So uh, you're going to call into the BP garage and... Uh, uh, no expense spared. Uh, get some tulips. And you'll bring them in. And uh, she'll be duly touched by your £3.25 gift. <laughs> and she put them on the centre of the table. And then people will come for lunch and they'll say, Oh, I love your tulips. Oh, yes, Herbert. He gave them to me. Oh, very nice. But suppose you called into the garden centre and bought a packet of bulbs, tulip bulbs, and came home and said, You know what? It's a while since I've done anything nice, so here's a little present for you. And, and you gave her, you know, ten tulip bulbs. <laughs> She's not going to put them on the centre of the table. 
And people aren't going to go, oh, those are lovely bulbs you have. <laughs> but there is an intrinsic relationship between the bulb and the, and the flower, isn't there? There's an intrinsic relationship. And, and so it is the apostle is telling us here, between the body that we now have and the body that we will be given. What is sown is perishable. That's the body we have now. But it will be raised imperishable. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. We know about that, don't we? How often do we say, oh, I'm tired. Or, oh, I'm just completely done in. It will be raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. So there, there is this element of continuity which is encouraging for us because surely then that nudges us in the direction of recognition, of knowing one another in heaven. But there is also of course transformation. Because this body that we will be given, yes, there will be an, an element of continuity, but it will also be transformed, it will be changed. And perhaps the most notable way in which it will be changed is, is the, the fourth matter which Paul brings before us here. So in a natural body, raised a spiritual body. Let's put a capital S in there. Because this is a body which is going to be dominated, controlled and empowered in every way by God the Holy Spirit. A body that will be entirely free from sin. A body that will be perfect in, in every aspect Utterly conformed unto the mind and will of God. Totally without sin. Now isn't that amazing? Isn't that amazing? Romans seven fourteen: The good that I would I do not and the evil that I would not that I do. Oh wretched man that I am. Never be on your lips. Never. Never. Because there is no sin there. Absolute perfection. And whatever this body will be like, this glorious body, like unto Christ's glorious body, it will be utterly and completely conformed unto the Lord in every way. I know that recently as a church you have known great sadness through the home call of Ted Donnelly and uh, Ted Donnelly's ministry touched you greatly throughout all of your congregations, I know that, but he exercised a wide ministry that touched many of us beyond the RP Church and within the APC he preached for us on numerous occasions and was highly respected and and greatly appreciated uh, among us. I noticed at his funeral service that uh, reference was being made to this book, Heaven and Hell, which he wrote um, some years ago. And it prompted me to lift it down from the shelf and to look at it again. Uh, and I came across this comment. Speaking about the glory of heaven, speaking about the perfected, glorified bodies which we will receive on the day of resurrection, referring to our glorification, Ted Donnelly says this, what is even more amazing is that our Lord and Saviour will himself be thrilled as he looks at us in heaven. Gazing upon his people, he will be filled with affection and delight. He shall see the labour of his soul and be satisfied. Isn't that amazing? When will we be glorified when Christ returns? What will our glorified bodies be like? Well, we do not know for sure, but there are hints given to us in Scripture. And then thirdly, where will we spend eternity in our new, glorified, perfected, resurrection bodies? And the answer to that is in the new heavens and the new earth. Uh, in Revelation 21, we read about the new heavens and the new earth. In Second Peter chapter 3, we also read about this uh, new heavens and new earth. 
Since all these things are to be dissolved, says the Apostle Peter, what sort of people ought you to be in lives of holiness and godliness, waiting for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be set on fire and dissolved, and the heavenly bodies will melt as they burn? But according to his promise, we are awaiting for the new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells, Second Peter 3, 10 and following. Uh, And this is where we shall spend eternity in our perfected, glorified bodies, in the new heavens and the new earth. The original, the Greek, has two words for new, neos and kainos. And it is kainos that is used here in Peter and in Revelation. And it's an interesting word. Let me try and illustrate it. You're just sitting at home one Saturday morning reading the paper. And your wife comes in and says, you couldn't come into the front room for a moment. So you go into the front room and she points to the sofa or the settee or the Chesterfield, whatever you call it. And she says, just look at that. Well, you take a look at it. It doesn't look any different to it did yesterday (laughs) or the day before. It's sitting there on the floor. She says, just look at that. You've had it for 24 years. It's very comfortable. It's quite saggy. It's a bit worn in the arms, but you can always get one of those, what they call them, a throw. You know, you can put that over it. Now, don't worry about that. And, and she says, take a look at that. Look at it. And you're looking at it, and then something in your head goes, Oof. serious moment. <laughs> you begin to see, you know, like desperate Dan sort of pound signs running around your head. You think, this isn't looking good. It's time for a new one. And then you put up some defense. You say, well, you know, dear, they, they don't make them like they used to. You know, they're just churning them out now and conveyor belts and not the same as they were. That one's got a really solid frame. That's, you know, that's, that's the real deal. And uh, you have a discussion, amicable more or less. And at the end of it, you are agreed that you're going to get your sofa refurbished. Right? You're going to take it to one of these places where they strip it down, they put in new foam, and then they put on cloth and, and all the rest. And then, and then it comes back from the refurbishment centre, and actually, you bring your neighbour in. She just happens to be passing. I've got a new sofa, a new sofa. Would, would you like to see it? And you bring her in, and you show it to her, and she goes, Oh, that's fantastic. Where was that? And there's going to be another poor man going through the same uh, procedure. <laughs> It's new. See my new sofa. But it's not entirely new, you know. It's refurbished, isn't it? It's been renovated. And when Jesus comes again in power and glory, the world as we now know it is going to be burned up with fire. And out of that conflagration will come the new heavens and the new earth. And as there is continuity between the body that we have now and the body which we shall receive, so there is continuity between the body we have now and the body that we shall receive, there is continuity too between the world as we now know it and the world that is to come. Continuity between the new heavens and the new earth and the world as we now know it. Now what exactly that will look like, I'm not sure. But think back to Eden. Think back to the Garden of Eden. Think back to the Lord walking with Adam and Eve in the, in the garden prior to the fall. And look forward to this new heavens and this new earth where we will be with the Lord in our perfected bodies. And acknowledge that there will be some continuity between what we now know and what we shall experience then. It'll be amazing. No sin there. The cowardly, the faithless, the detestable, murderers, sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters and all liars. Their portion will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur. That's, that's a tragedy. It's a tragedy. Terrible. But there will be no sin there in the new heavens and the new earth. Continuity, yes, but no sin. Not a fallen creation, but a perfected creation. All will be blessed. Oh, again, Revelation 21. He, the Lord, will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore. For the former things have passed away. 
and there will be an incredible harmony there between all the people of God in their perfected state and Jesus the Lamb we're told is in the midst of the throne we will worship him and adore him whatever occurs there in this new heavens and new earth doxology worship will be at the very heart of what we are doing we shall worship the lamb who is in the midst of the throne and adore him in perfection forever and ever and ever we shall never be bored of being there dissatisfied with that place discontent with the company unhappy with any aspect of it but in this rejuvenated refurbished creation we shall in our perfected glorified bodies adore Christ forever and ever and ever so take heart brothers and sisters you who are justified in the sight of God adopted into the family of God and are seeking each day to become more holy take heart this is your future This is what lies ahead. It is to this that the Lord will bring us ultimately. Look forward to the glory that is to come. And pray much that those who are dear to you and who are around you, who know not yet these wonderful truths of the gospel, pray much that in God's grace and love they will embrace our Saviour and that they will join with us there in the glory that is yet to be.